speaker is going to be uh, Assistant Ambrobert from the University of Cruz, and uh, I suppose you have had a chance to introduce him. He's very impressive with his applications and uh, a variety of topics related to comparative literature. And he's going to talk about the Turkey thing in Transylvania, uh, German and Hungarian Turkish studies. I'd like to recall the two colorful cases of practical Indians here, belonging to the southern part of Transylvania. One of them a German, Arthur Augusto Greza, and the other one a Hungarian, Michel de Vila. Actually, she had a former German inspired also Hungarian social, moral, political, and cultural tradition. Both of them had people wearing uniforms in their families because the uniform, be it military or civilian, signified that that child uh, dignity, bourgeois, respectability, social recognition, and discipline. Apart from their rather liberal approach to religious matters, there is a lot of Marx Weber's Protestant work ethics by being legendarily lazy. While Vichy opted for the Oriental religions and especially for Zoroaster Sahesta, both are town people, and both felt that they had some sort of particular humanitarian mission to share. Both were Transylvanian, that is, more cosmopolitan than the rest of the especially rural center and historic parts of Romania. Both experienced a peculiar reward in the values embodied by their fathers, but this was pretty common if we think of psychoanalysis, while which was the revolutionary religion at the time concerning so matters. It would be therefore more important to say that both of them opted for nature to replace society, and that they conceived the human being in a larger, organic perspective as part of a wider cosmic order. Moreover, both felt, as Nietzsche has said in his second Untimely Meditation, that the times of history are gone, that man must throw off the burdens of the past in order to live an enormous present, as Norman Baker labeled this feeling that it would be like in the hipster in the wild kingdom. When we come to the communitarian model of life Nietzsche and Grazer has trusted, we realized that it was merely empirical and scientifically grounded. Greza came to Monte Verita not only to find reclusion, but especially to read of the human experience of the senses, shared by people floating all around the place in some sort of happy sensorial dissemination. He was a rather solitary figure who didn't like Monte Verita at first, as reported. They treat him in order to fulfill the personal program of an exemplary solitude in a series of caves and improvised abodes, artistically adorned with ribbons, mystical symbols, and other artistic oddities, where they actually managed to raise eight happy children and to contain the cautiously dissatisfied life. On the contrary, Vichy and Vivela share the belief that a clean and organized bourgeois home is essential for a prophet to be trusted and believed. Even when he moved to the other kind of island of the Danube, building a house and accommodating his family where were his top priorities. Vichy and was family center, while for the laser family was nothing more than a living unit, very similar to a pack of happy wolves or a flock of birds. Vichy also likes stability provided by money, while Brazer was an errant saint and a beggar. He also had a superior sense of artistic sufferance, being repeatedly arrested for minor social crimes related to his life as a king. A saint must experience the unparalleled bit of the world, he used to say, if his goal remains redemption. By redemption, Reza didn't primarily understand the Vitasio Christi, that is, Pia Negativa, to live in such a way as to neutralize your instincts and your body, but in the already mentioned Nietzsche's terms, human elevation, artistic magnificence, and charisma, that is, the access to the so called great gestures, Gaberte, which characterize human superiority. 
The event that with its Nietzschean implications of splendor and magnificence was a key word in the Schwabinger Swallow vocabulary, marking Green Sands in his seminal mountain of truth, the counterculture begins, the best book written on the subject so far. It suggests the exaltation of the body to a larger than physical dignity. It expresses a splendor of life that is at once sculpture and biological. Splendor, which is actually a term coming from the Renaissance, also means an artistic and sexual transfiguration of the body, as well as a particular effervescence of solar worship. As we remember, Nietzsche's Zarathustra worshiped the sun and called himself a midday man, which meant an anti-romantic attitude because the midday man obtains his excellence by eliminating completely the inner and outer shadows of the being. Gustav Grazer had resolved his elitist complex by becoming a self-made artist to the great sorrow of the old man, who was a former student at Heidelberg and a well-respected judge in his rather small town of Kronstadt and who really hoped that at least one of his sons, of whom he had three, Karl, Arthur, and Ernst, will be a respected member of the local Protestant community. Luck had left him, apparently, because Karl, who became an officer at the time Gusto reached Monte Verita, decided to, drop, decided to drop his uniform in order to join his brother in Ascot. Arthur, born on the 16th of February 1879, changed his name into Busto because he felt Busto. He took pleasure in life. Being an old lady for a short period of time as Arthur Sieberberger. He was awarded the first prize in wood carving in the 1896 Vienna exhibition in Budapest, and thus he officially got his license as an artist. Two years later, he joined the painter Karl Wilhelm Diefenbach as an apprentice, living in the Himmelhof colony of the artist outside Vienna, also known for the members' sexual liberalism and the new form, as well as their interest in arts, combinatorial type sciences, and philosophy. Among the seven members who founded the Monte Verita community in Ascona, we find Ferdinand Brune, who came from Graz, the others were Gustav Glazer, Harry Ernie Cohen from Antwerp, and his wife Ida Hoffman from Montenegro. The latter's sister Jenny, Carl Glazer, lieutenant at the Times, Gustav's brother, and Lotte Hackerman, who came from Berlin. They met in Munich in 1900, acknowledged that they are fed up with the society of the humans and the civilization and decided to withdraw from the world by founding a commune of people belonging to the nature, nature mansion, amid the, the mild slopes of Ascona in Switzerland. The pattern wasn't exactly Fourier's Falasterian communal retreat understood as a working community, but it resembles to Toronto's immersion in nature for Walden, which implied the recapturing of the lost of cosmic energies through simplicity and solitude. A further anarchist ingredient boosted the technique, coming on behalf of the Tolstoyans, akin to the Croydon Brotherhood in England, who had founded a Tolstoyan community in Essex in 1896. A prominent member of this community was John Coleman Kenworthy, who wrote an anti-capitalist Bible of the new lifestyle entitled The Anatomy of Misery. Really inspired, inspired by Marx, Kenworthy equaled the new technological Greek capitalism with the dawn of the pure nature centered human beings. Respecting the ideas of the people, he was also aware that man had become too frail to find a technological monster in a place to his back. David Sling when confronting a liar was a good symbol of the human dignity, but it was futile to believe that it would be reenacted. It is impossible to fight the system with its own weapons, can well be declared in the anatomy of misery. One cannot touch pitch without being defined. Accordingly, the Natur Mansion did not dream of a huge universal revolution capable to fight and defeat the human system 
but they believe in the regulatory force of the many tiny local regulations, functioning as experts capable to convert people by convincing them that a simple nature central existence is by all means. Most of them were anarchists, deep down in themselves, but they also knew that the times of the direct confrontation were over. As it will happen later in the counterparts of the 60s, the newly founded organic communities, it's uh, one of the movers, uh, phrase, happened, uh, had no intention to directly fight the system, but to challenge it by establishing an alternative reality. The great Tolstoy had already pioneered the idea that the Tolstoyans were Christians too, but Christians outside the church. A big consequence concerning the understanding of power came out of this because this was the moment when people started to perceive cultural legitimacy in the terms of the tension existing between the official canon of the subversive and the subversive canons coded by the adjutant subcultures. Bichel Ribeiro, who is far less known in the Western world than the Glazers, also heralded the necessity to transcend the frailty of the human body by means of a powerful spiritual enlightenment. We usually believe that man is good because he is ontologically so, since ontology is rooted in nature. But for each enemy, nature was only the starting point, not the goal. The target was to go beyond nature, to transcend one's ontological premises, and Jesus had done it through self-sacrifice, crucifixion, and the sense. Accordingly, each enemy was an active prophet, um, wandering around to preach, to collect followers and disciples, to spread and disseminate his ideas, while Razor was especially passive by living in this cave unnoticed and waiting for the believers to come. The vegetarian master, that is, Vicerli, was accidentally born on the 20th of March 1872 in Budapest. But he was raised in Prague, a southern Transylvanian town located in between Hermannstadt, Sibiu, and Kronstadt, Brasov, where he also graduated, becoming a functionary of the state whose task was to supervise taxes. As a tax clerk, he was detached onto the northwestern border of nowadays Romania, where he was contaminated by syphilis at the age of 21. After he realized that no doctor could cure his illness in spite of visiting several European health institutions, Michel decided to take his life in his, uh, in his own hands by turning into a radical vegetarian and by doing hard physical training every day, which provided him a tremendous strength, becoming, as it has been recorded, one of the strongest people in Europe. At that time, the standard was the surplus acrobat. Well, one of the stronger, well, which had been challenged the two of them in fierce fighting, being always the victor. He was proud to walk around in shorts in winter, and he set five world records in weightlifting, the most notable of them happening in 1922 uh, in Cluj at the age of 50, when he pushed. 188 kilos from a laid down position. His energy was overheld. For instance, he strode 50 or even 60 hours uninterruptedly during his conferences. Some people from the audience went home, took a nap, and came back, only to find that the monster is still there, more flourishing than ever. Each and every central week was life while his arch enemies were fatigued and dead. His seminal book was entitled Ohala Legalization, which means defeating death 1924. It was sold in 7,000 homes at that time in Transylvania, mainly through direct subscription by the author who promised everlasting vigor to the future vegetarians and a life which will go well beyond the, the age of 800. The master served as a vivid example for at least several of his promises. 
his outstanding physical endeavors were achieved at the, the age of 55, 45 and 50. After becoming a vegetarian, he never fell ill, his boldness had stopped, and he got back several of his lost teeth. Moreover, he was twice beaten by vipers while wandering in the Federal Mountains, managing to neutralize the fatal outcome by overheating his body as if it was surrounded by an oil. Going to the marketplace, he easily lifted huge barrels with grain, making the peasants to believe that he was possessed by the devil. Bicepi started to preach the benefits of vegetarianism in 1922 in CPU, the early experience being larger in large in order to later in large in order to become a mass hysteria, never experienced in Transylvania before. Huge crowds waited for hours to take part in these sermons amid crashed doors and broken windows. The police closed entire streets to contain the frantic mob. The master seemed to be alien to the slightest sign of fatigue by speaking 60 hours in a row for what the necessity to return to nature and to ingest life instead of death, which enters the body when you eat previously slaughtered animals. He was always calm and logical when speaking, entertaining the crowd with strictly rational arguments. Apart from other creatures, he never reached the ecstatic level of the enlightened irrationality, suggesting that you do not need a special transrational faculty in order to be enlightened and to return to the sure path of truth. Apart from Razor, again, Bicelli was Gutenberg's disciple. He trusted the written letter as a tool of propaganda. When he came to learn that his prophetical substance has attained a proper level of spiritual maturation, Bicelli, who has not been a devoted scholar at the beginning of his career, started to write books frantically and to continuously improve his existing manuscripts and versions so that a early book of, let's say, 240 pages was, up, was upgraded within two or three years in order to become a thick tome of 700 or 800 pages. Which was practically unstoppable when we come to writing, editing, and selling out the products of his brain. He printed many thousands of copies of books, leaflets, and excerpts. He sent them by mail all over the world, not for free, obviously, which means that his belief in the force of the written letter was equal only by his huge ego and by the belief that four apples a day and a clever fast can heal all the sorrows of civilization. He was a practical, not a speculative reader and writer, which means that he was not attracted by the philosophical and moral depth of the book he used to recommend. For him, each book was good in simple its functions and a receipt as a practical guide for a better lifestyle. Martin Green quotes the dancer Rudolf Lava, an inhabitant of Monte Verita, the inventor of the modern dancing, full of dissonances and broken chains of nervous nevertheless beautiful choreography, who used to speak about the festive being of each person. A person's proper aim, in my view, said Laban, is his own festive being. From 1913, Laban moved his dance farm up to the hills of Monte Verita, urging its members to reach perfection by engaging in collective audio performances, abusively suspected for organized pornography by the locals living in the valley. Vichelli also believed in the healing value of the festive being. For instance, he solemnly announced that his transfiguration occurred on Christmas Eve 1912 within the effervescence of the feast. It was the precise moment when he had become, through vegetarian wisdom and endurance, the third embodiment of the immemorial, immemorial Messiah, followed Zoroaster and Christ. He did so by activating his mystic aura, the so-called farewell. 
derived from the Persian concept of Parvashi or Fravashi, Fenner was conceived by each other as a spiritual veil covering the body of the few who meditated to be elected. The historian of religion Friedrich Kreitzer, who studied the concept in a book published in 1813, has demonstrated that the understanding of Parvash in the Persian mysticism is different from the significance of the idea of paradigm from Plato's system of thinking because the world functions as an intensity attached to each being, which can be activated through specific techniques of bodily and spiritual purification. Peruel is the reminiscence of the cosmic fire inherent to our being. Therefore, Bichel insisted that the body must reach a certain level of incandescence in order to be healed. By eating vegetables and fruits, that is, life, one may sustain the incandescence, whilst by ingesting them, slaughtered animals, the heat is dissipated. The scholarly paradox of which this teaching consists of its lack of interest concerning classical Hinduism or Buddhism, which might be explained by the master's special fidelity to the existing world. That is, no nirvana, no detachment, but the ethics of staying within the world in order to activate its potencies of healing. You probably remember Hermann's, uh, Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha, which is a novel dominated by the fictional hypothesis of an anti-Buddha. Hesse visited Bonte Verita several times, I prepared a PowerPoint, but unfortunately there is no place to show it, being also the author of a widely quoted text over there, The Artist and the Psychoanalysis, written in 1918. After Hesse left the sanatorium of mental disturbances, when he was cured by one of Carl Gustav Jung's followers, the psychoanalysis that the novel he read. In his essay, Hesse states that persons who have already activated their artistic dimension or are evidently in search of uh, it have specific needs and therefore they are unable to be judged on the grounds of the common rules. The novel Siddhartha features a fictional confrontation between the enlightened Buddha and the young Siddhartha, his visitor, who does not want to become Buddha. <coughs> there is an inner paradox of what you are preaching, Siddhartha says to Buddha. On the one hand, you say that the world is perfection, uh, as every creature is perfectly harmonized with all the others. And then you preach the capacity for the nirvana, the necessity to leave the world by going beyond it. If the world is perfection, how can you explain that the humans can reach that excellence only by stepping outside this perfection? The challenge resounded to Nietzsche's understanding of the mission of the so-called Zarathustrians, who are the special beings whose existence determines the quality of an epoch of that of a generation. Nietzsche stated that the universe in itself has no capacity to activate this Dionysian energy, but by the intervention of an opener who opens the valve and or lifts the lid of the boiling water, thus freeing the repressed energy. The opener must stay inside the world, not outside it. His power is not a moral one, guided by duty or limitations, but it belongs to the best realm of the cosmic artistry. So aesthetics becomes the precise faculty which indicates that certain people manage to surpass the subtle threshold which marks the border between expressing and being expressed, between the will to create, which is human, and the never-ending creative impersonality of the cosmic play, the love from the, the Hinduism. Gustav Glaser happily quoted Nietzsche and Dostoevsky, who 
have said that the decay of the Christian civilization originated in Christ's decision, uh, decision to go up into the heavens instead of staying with his flocks here on the earth. Jesus preached no beyond, Teresa used to say to his listeners during his open air lectures uh, heard in a school. Be happy, just there to live. Instinct is nature. The idea went up in time, permitted the counterculture of the sixties, and later evolved in Peter Lambert Wilson's, uh, also known as Hakim Bay's, idea of the TAZ, the temporary autonomous zone, heralded in a book published in 1991. Rooted in the political syntax of the Buddha and anarchist of the 19th century, Hakim Bey's idea suggests that by using violence in their game to exercise full control of the masses, the political regimes necessarily generate, generate the wish to establish temporary autonomous zones, TAZs, whose aim is to elude formal centralized structures of control. You remember Tocqueville with his democracy in America. The real power of a political system is measured by its will to raise dissidents. Thank you very much.